Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. You are now listening to season seven of the show. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Alex McPherson. Alex graduated from the University of Oxford and is an ex-city lawyer, having spent 10 years at Freshfields and Hogan Lovells. He has a wealth of legal experience as he completed client secondments at the likes of Tesco, ExxonMobil, and Goldman Sachs. In 2015, Alex founded the award-winning Ignition Law, a high growth, full service law firm working with world leading business schools, universities, investors, and much, much more. Alex is also the co founder and partner of Ignition Financial, providing virtual CFO, accounting, tax, fundraising, and exit advisory services to entrepreneurs and more. Additionally, Alex is an entrepreneurship expert at the Entrepreneurship Center of Side Business School, a non executive director at Innie Accounts, and sits on the corporate advisory board of Lexus. Nexus. Alex has won several accolades, including Managing Partner of the Year at the Modern Law Awards 2022, Best Contribution by an Individual at Law Work Awards, and Alex has recently been shortlisted for the Service Industries Entrepreneur of the Year category in 2023 at the Great British Entrepreneur Awards. With that in mind, a very big warm welcome, Alex. Thanks so much, Rob. Appreciate it. It, it always feels quite scary hearing all your accolades and amazing achievements being said back to you, doesn't it? But it's all it's all true and it's all there. And before we dive into all your amazing projects and experiences today, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is on the scale of one to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? We, we, we are certainly fans of Suits. I would say, I wish it was real. I would say a three or a four. I think the idea of doing probate law in the morning, M&A at lunch and litigation in the afternoon in a very glamorous way, unfortunately, certainly not quite my, my life, unfortunately, but it's, yes, yeah, great series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you described that very well. And for people who are probably getting their feet into the legal world, it's sort of a heart surgeon, then becoming a foot doctor, then becoming a, a hand surgeon specialist. It's not all achievable in, in one day. And with that, let's move swiftly on to talk all about you, Alex. Would you mind telling our listeners a bit about your background and career journey? Yeah, of course. So, so I was, I'd always wanted to be a, a, a lawyer and, and had, had got work experience. Um, I'm from the South Coast, from, from near Bournemouth, and had got quite a lot of experience at local law firms and really loved that from family law through to criminal law and corporate. So I sort of arrived at university knowing I always wanted to be a lawyer and, and, and applied for vacation schemes and training contracts and went quite a traditional route in the city, Freshfields and Hogan Lovells, two, two very large um, English UK firms that, that, are, that are brilliant and had a, had a wonderful, wonderful time at, at both, um, skilling up quite a lot on broad corporate, corporate law. Hogan Lovells, I was at Hogan Hartson, which was an American firm with a smaller office in London that then merged with Lovells. So I sort of had the benefit of working in a smaller hundred odd person firm in London, which I which I really loved the, the chemistry and the and 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 the uh, office there. And then when we merged with Lovells, it was it it had a lot more of the structure. So so I saw quite a few angles of of law and managed to get quite a few comments in, which was was great to open the eyes. And um, so that was that was my typical journey, I, I suppose. And then as I got a little bit more senior, ended up working more and more with smaller clients, entrepreneurs, people setting up businesses, university spin outs. And that was quite a challenge to do that economically at a large firm because they're very quite particular re- requirements. And I got, got more and more involved in, in uh, entrepreneurship myself with loads of ventures that failed spectacularly and, and, and some that did OK. But it, but it felt very different, very, very exciting in terms of what I was doing. And, and so that really led me to start to think about what's my USP as a lawyer? What, what, it is, what is it that I really want to do and am, am I passionate about? What's my business case to move forward? And, and that always led very firmly towards entrepreneurship. I love that. And I think you've had such an incredible journey and there's quite a lot to unpack um, throughout all of that. Um, what I do want to sort of mention is what you touched on before is um, success doesn't really teach you a lot. It's the failings that actually teach you a lot of things. So you make a very valid point about lots of failings that probably in hindsight have actually benefited you tremendously throughout your career. But I want to go back to um, Freshfields and Hogan Lovers just a little bit more because, you know, you did spend, a, you know, near enough a decade in, in the city, which is, you know, a testament to a lot of hard work um, and a lot of, you know, high quality work you'd have been exposed to. Um, what did you most enjoy about working in the city? It's a great question. And, and to try and answer it with a view to kind of helping lawyers of the future and people trying to find their journeys, 
I think for me, the thing that was was fantastic there was clarity of structure, working with really, really bright, bright minds and real leading firms where you, you were doing high quality work, things that you'd see in, in the papers all the time had a really clear career structure, which which I think is very important at the start of your career. Law is very, very good like that in terms of law school, the seats, as we call them in a in a training contract, and the ability to be mentored and supported. I, I had a wonderful a series of mentors, but that, that remain friends to this to this day, and that was that was brilliant. And that really get, gets you started in life. And so I'd say those are the things I, I I enjoyed enjoyed most in 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 my city career. Yeah, and you've made a really good point about mentorship, and it's something we talk a lot about on the show. You know, it's very important to create almost your your, your own board of directors outside of the four walls in which you not only operate in terms of your firm, but to have mentors that can, you know, maybe teach you things, you can learn new opportunities. And back to the point that we we're talking earlier about failures, um, you know, they've probably failed a lot more and been a lot further down the track than you, and they can shortcut a lot of those things um, for you. So it's really important. So thank you for highlighting that. And um, you had some tremendous succumbents as well. You work for the likes of Tesco. Exxon, Goldman, of course. So, you know, how did these secondments particularly shape your perspective on the legal industry? Yeah, so I think it's very easy, especially when you're quite junior in, in law, to get quite institutionalised, which which isn't a criticism of anyone, any one firm, but you are under pressure, you're surrounded by a lot more senior people and, and you're working long hours. And I think of the secondments, Tesco in particular, when I was very junior, was, was fascinating because it was it was an incredibly commercial experience. You know, I'd been doing corporate law where I was a, and quite rightly, a, 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 um, a small cog in, in, a, in, a, in a huge machine doing learning the ropes. Whereas Tesco was a was, a, was notably a, a flatter structure, which was was quite good for kind of reframing one's perspective and the notion of your work and what you were doing, what you were delivering to your boss, really going to to value, going to the bottom line was 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 really important actually. And and there were. There were what was so great about that business it has a, a really nice culture it was i had two fantastic bosses and the work i was doing was really tangible you know it involved local stores it's not breaking any um com- uh, confidentiality to, to to give a couple of examples at a very high level you know publicly tesco had had a, an issue with one store at gerrard's cross where there was there was architectural problems of it of it, of it collapsing that there were issues around naturally resolving things that related to store store managers and uh, and what was going on at stores and, and the first job i ever had when i was earning money was two pounds 75 on a tesco checkout to over the summer of 1997 and so i could really relate to the business you know and it taken me a lot of time and hard work to earn eight nine hundred pounds to start to put towards the first first car and meeting all sorts of people on the checkout and learning how to respect how to engage with them um, was was by far the, the the biggest learning curve I had as you know before b- b- before getting to the age of eighteen, going off to to university and having gap year. But, but so I could really relate back to that business age twenty six, twenty seven on secondment there in the legal team and, and and what I was doing and how it really would necessarily correlate to what was going on at at, at, at the stores in question. Yeah, and again, you give some really good examples there of of, of the benefits of of also going on to comment and what you see and, and what you get to sort of shape your, your your legal professional journey. And talking of journeys, we must switch to the sort of entrepreneurial journey, which is by no means beat a straightforward one. I'm talking from my own experiences, but would love to get your take, Alex, on on your journey of founding Ignition Law. Can you talk us through that? Of course, it's about eight eight years now, or or an inch of hairline, which whichever you prefer. It's um, <laughs> it's 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 been great. You know, I I as a, I think I was saying, it, it felt very different to be doing entrepreneurial things within within law, to be helping friends that were setting things up, and and um and to be running a business where you had to kind of use your legal knowledge for companies' house filings, doing your accounts, taking a view on risk in a very practical sense. So that's sort of what led me to it in twenty. 20- 15 what had happened was 2014 for new year's eve we had some some really nice friends staying over at our house in in hertfordshire and we all had quite a lot to drink and made, made our new year's pledges and i sort of came out with a pledge that i probably remembered and fixated on a lot more than anyone else but nonetheless i'd sort of said by the end of 2040 given myself effectively a year i was going to um, I was going to leave, you know, very amicably, incredibly close to Hogan Lovells, and 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 love and respect the firm and all my colleagues to to this to this day. But it, it just was my business case was pointing towards SMEs and entrepreneurship. So I spent 
So I made that pledge, which I think is probably one point to try and pass on to people. Actually, if you write something down, you make a commitment to yourself. It gives you, and you've done that within a clear temporal framework, it gives you a point to work towards and to really stick to like, like super glue. And I sort of started to say this more publicly. So it became a real thing in my head that, right, I've got, got a year. What was really, really great for me, and I, I always try my best to pay the, pay the goodwill back to the universe, is, is people gave lots of time and, and effort when I asked for their advice. And so I met GCs, I met um, partners, I met all sorts of people and just shared with them. I was in a very happy place, but, but, but was looking for a next step in terms of my, my legal career. And, and, and that's something that I think is, is often under, underestimated is asking people for their advice. It gives them such a compliment and people are, are, are generally only too happy to help. So I sort of went through 2014 making notes. I remember meeting one, one friend in particular who was very senior to an oil and gas um, super major company. And he sort of said, if I, if I work really hard, I, I, I do an hour extra a day, I get a, a nine week fortnight. And and I was really envious of that. And I sort of wrote down, I reflected on it. And, and it became clear later by making these notes, actually what I was envious was his sense of autonomy. And, and that's a, you know, it's a common thing that goes to fulfillment in, in the workplace. And the more I started kind of digging under the detail, the answer for me personally wasn't to go in house at that company and to, to have that flex. It was more having a sense of autonomy and a sense of really building something and, and, and being able to perhaps do something in a value led way. And so, so all of these notes started joining together. And by the autumn of 2014, I had a, a couple of junior partner offers from a couple of um, excellent smaller firms that were focusing on entrepreneurs and SMEs. And so I sort of had those in, in pocket, if you like, and then had this business plan that I really believed in and actually thought the right thing to do is to have a tilt at that. If it, if it doesn't work, hopefully they'd respect the fact that I that I tried. And we found a really good joint venture partner in a new progressive firm called Gunner Cook. We did a, a fee share deal with them. So that day one, January 2015, we were set up with proper professional indemnity insurance, operations, client accounts, all that sort of stuff. And so it, in my mind, at least, it was there was quite a good hedge there. I'd got a backup plan and I'd taken a lot of time to kind of listen and work out what I wanted. And in particular, the clients and and people I'd really reached out to were hugely supportive and one even came on day one or day two saying right you you said this would be the proposition at lower cost point I want eight hours a month and send me an engagement letter and so it sort of hopefully snowballed in a in a nice way yeah I love the um, met- methodical thinking the strategy you know there was a lot of thought behind this because you get some entrepreneurs they'll just like someday you know I'll, I'll, I'll knock down a wall and I'll start and I'll go through it but there was a real sort of system and process and thought process that went into it and clearly that's why Ignition Law has gone on to be so successful um, but there's lots to to sort of take from that particularly that you know you were obviously getting you know offers for, for junior partner level so you kind of had that insurance policy which probably gave you that extra internal confidence you know I'm going to go for this. I'm going to try for this myself because I always know there might be something else there. And the fact that you're really writing down that what you wanted to make was important for you. And you mentioned about autonomy and having that, you know, it's really important you understand that passion and that why for your business and the value you want to give to um, whatever venture in the legal or other side world. So really liked your your school of school of thought and how you went about that. But so tell us more then. Obviously, Ignition Law started. What do you specialize in? What are some of the most high profile clients or things you've most enjoyed working on whilst uh, since founding the firm? Yes. Yeah, so, so we started and we were looking for a bit of a niche. I am quite a structural person. I think that's definitely, hopefully, a, a tip I'd try and share with anyone else thinking of setting up is, is you can do it on all sorts of free websites, a Myers-Briggs type personality test, work out what it is that's going to make you happy. And for me, sad as it is, it's structure and process and all. And, and so my personality type that was coming out was ENTJ. It subsequently they evolve at ESTJ. So both very much on that would thrive in trying to build something, trying to create structure and trying to lead an organization. So, so that really helped me um, to start to frame, frame that in my own head. We, we got started, and if you like, there's almost two key elements to a law firm in, in a very basic sense. There's, there's the people and the culture that you create, and there's, of course, the clients that you're, that you're trying to serve. And I think it was quite clear at the start, we wanted to focus on startups, scale-ups, entrepreneurs. And we, we, we were focusing very, very early on with people setting up. We, we do a lot more work with scale-ups, with SMEs, with a series of innovative products that, that allow um, outsourced general counsels and subscription legals and, and things like that. But we started very, very early 
running around London, walk breakfast, lunch, dinner, all hours to, and then working in the evening until silly, silly o'clock. And, and that, that was enough to kind of get up and running. And, and the fact that we'd done a joint venture to outsource a lot of the operations, compliance, risk management, client accounts, that, that freed up some time. So that was the thinking there. I think the thing we probably weren't as clear of that, that started to become apparent is there were these incredibly talented lawyers who, who left law, who'd, you know, one cliche being had, had children, which still is a huge issue in the industry, which naturally disproportionately impacts women. I'm a dad of two, two girls at, at, at home and, and really believe very passionately in their, in their future and their right to do whatever they, they, they wish. Um, so I think that became clear very quickly, partly where, where I live in Hertfordshire. A lot of friends got in touch saying, um, you know, would, would it be possible to kind of do some consultancy? And you looked at these CVs that were, that were just ex- extraordinary. And, you know, in eight years, I think we yet to really have a client that sort of says they don't, don't like that element of the proposition, that it's a very senior, talented lawyer with a huge amount of experience at a, at a lower price point that, that maybe is working flexibly, just, just as we both are today from, 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 from home and, and work in the evening or in the morning. Because a lot of the training that goes into lawyers, that doesn't come unstuck when you work at a, at a smaller firm. You're still disciplined on attention to detail, response times. And so that, that element was, was slightly more serendipitous in 2015, that there was this hugely talented pool of, of, of people. And then it was a case of starting to work out what works, what, what doesn't work. And as we grew, you know, when I think back to our turnover and what, what we were sharing, we were able to start to share the upside of that, which is, which is a hugely important part of, of our journey so that um, we, we were equally loyal to those that, that, that helped us when, you know, when there was a table and a printer and that was about it. <laughs> but, you know, never forget where you come from, right? And never forget where you started. And, and those that, their, you know, loyalty is, 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 you know, if you are loyal and you do the right thing, you, you will be rewarded. And absolutely, it's great that you've done that. And that's great leadership. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, talent doesn't lose talent just because they can't work flexibly or they need flexibility, right? And I think giving them the option, I actually think it's firms like yourselves and, and, and others that are probably getting really high quality talent and probably getting the best out of them because they're able to perform when they're able to perform. We're actually trying to get people to juggle with rushing to the school gates or to do bath time or, you know, I'm a dad of a daughter myself. And, you know, just having that flexibility um, is so important. And and so it, it's it's not only that you're giving people a chance, you're probably allowing them to play to their strengths when they want to be and can be performing at their best. So let's talk a little bit more then, because, you know, I love the world of sort of high growth and, you know, scale ups, et cetera, et cetera. You know, starting a high growth full service law firm is no small feat, right? And so what are some of the challenges you faced while setting up Ignition Law and how did you overcome them? And because the reality is you were still quite happy at Hogan Levels, you know, you were still quite happy then. It wasn't a case of, look, I desperately wanted to leave it. So you had something inside you wanted this autonomy. So then go on to the entrepreneurial land and then you start getting hit with all these challenges, you know, Talk us through that and how you got over it. Yeah, it's a great question. I hope it's helpful to, to share with people for wh- whatever their journeys m- might well be. But f- for me, the first thing was having a really honest conversation with my, my wife. And that wasn't that easy a conversation in, in 2014 because she, she's, she's less, um, she was more concerned about the, the risk, of, which was high, you know, it was really significant. So her preference would have been take a role at a, a large established firm, a more traditional firm. And that, that, was, that was a case of just being really honest with ourselves about what was going to make us happy and, and also setting some boundaries around that. So we had, you know, several months worth of savings and it was a case of not letting it fail. You know, it was a case of a really extraordinarily hard 2015. And I, I wasn't the best version of myself then. There's no question about it. You know, I was, was, was just, I was 35 then, I'm 43 now and was, working till you know two two three a.m it was kind of website you know midnight one a.m it was and this was a joint venture partner which made it a lot easier and I sort of got to probably October and was starting to you know I'm very lucky I don't think to have suffered from um, mental health issues or any diagnosed mental health issues and nonetheless I was starting to get into you know a, a not brilliant version of myself not making the best decisions family dropping down the list in, in, in real terms we, we were pregnant with our our second daughter um 
and and um and it was we we lost my mother-in-law who we were incredibly close to midway through 2015 and and i was all i could control is not letting the business fail and getting it up and running and 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 i was very lucky to found a fantastic coach and um, mark smith who is what is one of the best coaches going for, for for law firms and 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 had some really good conversations to start to think about why am i you know frazzled making slightly bad decisions missing the wood for the trees and and as someone who's not particularly sporty um as in like really not sporty i'd have teams argue over who was left with me um i i started to go to a little fitness first at that october from our initial office in in, in um, liverpool street and getting a coach and actually that whilst they weren't necessarily that um it wasn't where i was going to end up you know in terms of fitness routine it was it was a start and i think that's a really important point for people is to just find a routine that works make that start and then that that was key so i think there's probably paradigm number one which was getting up and running not failing lots and lots of big um risks circling around the firm that each are frankly existential you know most businesses fail in the first year most fail in the, in the first couple of years and very few would, would get to two million turnover plus and i think that probably was the first scary bit you know to get get to that that number which sounds high but it's not a lot really when you're in a law firm so 2015 2016 getting getting airborne if you like there and then almost entering a slightly different paradigm shift where for me that sort of structure and discipline but boring as it was sometimes it was all about risk management it was moving into ops it was moving to working on the business rather than just just in it just as just as hard but trying to work 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 smarter rather than harder and bring people in i had huge gaps in my people management skills and and nobody really teaches you that in in, in, in my view in, in a more junior level um it, it's under taught in the legal industry so it was skilling up through a lot of fails a lot of mistakes losing a few really good people through not having the leadership skills to have candid conversations in in the right way and and really kind of getting through paradigm two, if you like, sort of two million to four, something like that, and and actually having more of a structure. And you know, even even now we're at the stage of about five, about eighty of us in total, and and still there's things going on. Like we brought in a fantastic full time uh, client services and BD um, head of BD, and I look back and I'm like, gosh, why didn't we do that two years ago? You know, that would have been. But 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 I think you kind of have to see it as as chapters and have a little bit of empathy for. For yourself and, and what you're going through at the time yeah you have to celebrate the little wins along the way because you know firstly thank you for being so refreshingly honest um with the journey because that's only going to help people and i think you you started very sensibly i believe at the conversation with your family right because you know a lot of why you do this and what it's for typically originates about trying to do it for your family yourself your own goals and actually to to get the support or to have the conversation and, you know, at least put it on, you know, I think is the right thing to do. And you know, I always say, you know, to run a business, you're going to go through a lot of, a lot of, a lot of setbacks, but you had that wit mentality, whatever it takes. Right. And that's the harsh reality. I think for people listening to this, even with AI coming in, it's basically going to be able to do any business for you. And it's been quoted the next billion dollar business can be as little as three people it's not easy, right? And so you will have these setbacks and you make some really good points. You know, why was Roger Federer one of the best players at tennis in the world? Yes, undoubtedly he was naturally talented, but he had a great coach, right? So just every, get, get a coach is having a strength. I like that. Then you focused on what's important and what Stephen Bartlett talks a lot about. You know, what's the number one pillar for him? It's his own health. You know, you talked about fitness. For me, I will walk 10,000 steps, whatever it takes, any weather a day, because I want to make sure that I'm up, I'm moving, I'm mobile, and, and I'm feeling good um, as a result of it. And then as you talked about your scaling journey, I always say new level, new devil. You know, you're going through these new levels. There's going to be new challenges that come as a result of that. And you, you, you've done fantastically well. And, you know, you've also done a lot of internal reflecting, which I think, you know, thinking of my journey, I probably should have done more of the time. When you think about the people management side, you think about, you know, how you could have done things differently. But to our point that we talked about before, success teaches you nothing it's those failings it's losing those people it's losing that client it's those things that happen and then you reshape and redo it and you know you also touched on a great point about i still believe you, every business should be marketing why do coca-cola continuously invest 
heavily in their marketing, even though everyone knows who they are, because you still need to stay top of mind. You need to be out there and you need to do it in new, innovative ways. So I absolutely loved everything about that answer. And I'd strongly encourage people, if you want to sort of really listen and learn to that, go back and rewind it and just really take the lessons from, from what Alex shared there. Cause it's really authentic. It's really open. And it's going to be super helpful if you're really thinking of starting a business in the legal world or outside. Time for a short break from the show. Calling all lawyers who want to work smarter, not harder. Are you tired of following old processes just because? Or do you feel like your current setup is letting you down? Then I recommend you try Clio, the legal software that streamlines your workflow and keeps your entire firm organized. With Clio's cloud-based legal software, you can quickly and easily manage your cases, billing, documents, and calendar, all from one place. They've even got an easy to use mobile app, so you can stay on top of your cases wherever you go. Join the tens of thousands of legal professionals worldwide who trust Clio for all of their legal needs. It's the legal software that works for the modern law firm. Dive in, start using it right away with their seven day free trial. Sign up now at clio.com forward slash legally speaking. That's C L I O dot com forward slash legally speaking. Now back to the show. So let's get back to it. That's my mini sort of summit, <laughs> summary of it. But the firm has and was groundbreaking in a pre COVID world, you know, in terms of the flexibility. We've talked about the work life balance element, we've talked about the remote working. But what initiatives have been successful in promoting a healthy work culture? Because you talked about the two pillars, you know, the, the people and the culture. And what is the culture you strive to have at Ignition Law? Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, it means a huge amount. And, and, um, and that's yeah, it's a good it's, it's a good good question with COVID. I mean, quite rightly, COVID's rendered any USP of you can work flexibly. You know, we've got a lovely office in Farringdon that you can work there. You can work at home. That that that's quite rightly no longer a USP. And also, it, it's getting better and better that a USP isn't that um, that um, lawyers coming back to work um, are, are, can work flexibly. That, that a lot of people have, have championed that which is brilliant. So I think you're right. I think the USP post COVID is all about culture and all about values. And we've got um, very, very, very simple um, mission statement, which is helping entrepreneurial lawyers and clients thrive. And we agonized over that word thrive. So it's got a sense of positive energy. It's got a sense of growth and development, not too much hierarchy um, and a, a sense of personal journey, which, which is there both for um, colleagues and both for clients you know the, the whole point of what's fun with working with SMEs is it's a really candid relationship and it's all about those failures and living and learning we, we we put quite a lot of investment in 2018 2019 about halfway through our journey to kind of clarify and codify what our, our culture and what our what our behaviors were and they they're very simple they spell the word scaled so there's two that are client facing uh, sourcing and cultivating going out there finding clients and cultivating, looking after those clients and really cultivating the relationships and looping colleagues to cross-sell. The A and the L of Scaled are um, a colleague facing, assisting and leading. There's a real sense of needing to be a self-starter to work with entrepreneurs. You won't always get told what, what to do, but a real need to kind of assist colleagues, help with all manner of issues, whether it's capacity or, or technical drafting checks. And then there's two community-facing values, which constitute evangelizing and delivering ultimately um delivery is the work product going out the door and being technically correct um and and that there's a trade-off that so the kind of sourcing and cultivating at the start of finding clients and the kind of looking after those relationships those skills you can't really monopolize you know some of my technical skills have probably gone down a little bit because a lot more of my time is focused on uh, sourcing and cultivating finding clients and cross-selling and looking after the relationships and so they kind of represent a real team element and, and the e the e the evangelizing of scaled is all about building a personal brand so one is actually empowered rather than it just being the firm's brand that that's important too but it needs to be the case that people can ultimately choose to leave can feel that they're empowered can start to build a practice and make sure they're looked after and have that personal leverage so we got quite sort of clear on that and, and, a, and a friend of mine in covid said said to me and she ran a very she was gc at a very general council a very successful retail business that kind of bucked the trend over covid and she said 
um, some really good advice midway through the, lock, the first lockdown that in her view, culture eat strategy for, for breakfast. And that was really helpful because you can spend lots and lots of time on, on the kind of technical strategy and the numbers. And whereas actually, if you've not got hearts and mind and clarity, at least in a scale up business, it's, it, it's a challenge because the great thing about culture is if you get it right, it starts to self-police. You know, it's, it's the best definition I know is culture is what happens when the when you, when you leave the office, you know, when, when you've stepped out of that room, it's what happens in, in, in your absence. And, and that can be very powerful, both across agile working and physically in an office, once, once you've got it right. And, and, and that's someone we put a lot of work into. And it necessarily involves lessons of, of failing and, and growth in leadership by people quite rightly calling you out when things are wrong, when they don't agree, um, when someone's not a good cultural fit. You, you you have to really be in for a penny and for a pound with with with, with culture and 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 where it leads you yeah and again thank you again for such some great insights i think open transparency you know nobody wants an echo chamber and actually challenging is good because that can lead to to growth i mean the comfort zone is great but we all know nothing grows there i think you make a really good point about personal brand and i talk a lot and speak a lot on that and I think it's your um, it's your biggest asset in a good market, and I think it's your biggest insurance mark policy in a downturn market because you may may things may happen, but you're never going to lose your, your your personal brand, and that can bring things from it. And your focus on community, I, I really believe, with the enhanced digital connected world that we're in, if you really play to community and really sort of double down on that, that can lead to so many benefits for for people within that client lead generation, you name it, and. Again, your focus on on excellence as well. Always remembering clients, you know, what are we putting out? What is the output? And, and really sort of doubling down on that because it's all well and good doing all this stuff, but we need to ensure that we're also delivering on the financial. And I always say one of my mentors said to me to be successful, it's double F. You've got to be ferociously focused. And just listening to you right now, you're ferociously focused on everything that you're doing and the direction you're taking your firm. And it's it, it's really heartening to see it. You're doing it in a very personal way as well. You, you're a dad, you know, you're, you're trying to deliver it in, in a modern form, which I think this industry has needed for a long time because you know you know mental health you know we've touched on it you know for myself as a business owner you will always have challenges and if you don't have that supportive um modern empathy but on an understanding and flexibility i think you're going to fail ultimately long term as a firm so this is clearly why you're doing so so well um so i want to ask a, a little bit more about skills because are there any skills you believe are crucial for aspiring entrepreneurs to develop and i guess what are some of the challenges you see in terms of the clients you're advising that entrepreneurs are, are facing because if i was to restart my journey i would do things 10 times differently and they're probably doing similar things and getting similar challenges so tell us a little bit about the skills and the challenges of the clients that you you work with yeah of course so skills so I think the, the the biggest skill that you need, and that certainly is still sometimes a challenge, but you know one that is great to work on is 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 listening. You know, it's it's there's there's listening at a superficial level. There's listening to kind of reply. There's listening on a slightly deeper level, and there's you know all the skills that coaches have, which I I certainly haven't got to that degree at all. But where you can listen superficially, listen what's going on for that person that week, what's going on that month, and and actually with that comes a need to have empathy you know i i would one of the skills i was massively lacking on was you know frustration bulldozing through a wall rather than actually working on empathy and 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 you know putting yourself in that person's shoes and trying to really relate to them that's just such a fundamental skill because people really remember what how they felt with interactions not necessarily with technical advice or who's won, won the you know the 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 actual battle it's much more about building a um, building trust and, and and having that empathy. I'd say the I mean a simple skill that's that's dry but important is 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 writing stuff down and using it, referring to it, and taking notes and reflecting later. Me meditation's brilliant. You know, most of the world's most successful entrepreneurs meditate and take time to to, to reflect and 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 get their macro picture. Um, I th I think probably. A skill that isn't my strongest, but it's one that you know it's good to be public on and try and build a team around you is is is, is bravery. You know, is is I'll sometimes put off having a tricky conversation and actually kind of force yourself if you publicly declare that you know I'm I'm likely to try <laughs> try to want to just make everyone happy. 
actually you can kind of build a team that challenge you and, and, and push you forwards in terms of in terms of that key skill. I, I think I think bravery is 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 also fundamental for small businesses. You know, there will be times almost all early clients, you know, will have times where they worry, is it going to make it? Are we going to be okay? And that 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 bravery not to kind of um buckle to short term pressure and and to and to push back and stand up for what, what you're trying to do over, you know, on a quarter by quarter basis. That that's a skill that that needs a lot of um work. I mean I think the other skill which is very relevant to a lot of your listeners and, and professional services and law is 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 recruitment and HR. And that that actually I sort of hoisted a red um a white flag on that early on. And I remember it being so 2016 I kept on doing a terrible job of of having views on recruitment and always seeing the best of people. And you know, one one interview and they were in and 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 actually hoisting a white flag saying I'm not very good at I'm not very good at management accounts, not very good at finance not very good at people skills in terms of recruitment i'm good generally but not not necessarily brilliant at recruitment strategy and spotting issues and 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 the right questions to ask that was quite a relief to kind of um to, to be very public internally with um with the skills i lacked and and some of those you can't necessarily well i don't necessarily think i could be taught very quickly so that then allowed space to kind of build and fill those voids and 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 end of 2015, coming in 2016, was a big time for for realizing you can't do everything. And actually, when you have that vulnerability and let that um, that guard down, you you do sometimes get burned in terms of you know one or two people maybe taking advantage or maybe um, you know not 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 reacting in the way that you wished. But but by far and large, you find out you know who your who your friends are and who your key colleagues are and where that loyalty is. And I think that's, um, those, those are the key skills I would say that are, that are really important. Yeah. And again, thank you for, for sharing your, your, your lessons there. You know, the bravery point really sticks to me. I, I sort of liken that to, to authentic leadership, right? Because, you know, my late grandfather who, who ran his own law firm and, you know, built that to be a very successful law firm in the 1950s in the Midlands where, where I herald from, we always used to say to me, look, Rob, anyone can be successful. It's far harder to stay successful. Right. And a person who never made a mistake never existed. Right. And that's the reality. You know, we all will make mistakes. And I think sometimes being brave enough to say, look, maybe I don't have all the answers right now, or maybe I did get that wrong, but these are the things I'm going to do to try and rectify. Or what do you think is, you know, it's a really important part of who you are as a leader. And I think it's really important to people understand that you don't have to always weigh it all on your shoulders sometimes and to be brave enough to say you're going to own something or to be brave enough to say, look, you don't necessarily have the answers and to include people and to collaborate with mastermind is, um, is really important. Um, Alex, there's lots of other topics and things I would love to to, to cover and carry on. And we, with that, we are going to try and cram in as much as we can because I'm really enjoying the conversation. There's lots of wisdom that you've shared thus far. Um, the first question, of course, is, you know, the evolving, rapidly changing world that we're living in, you know, it's quite hard to predict tomorrow, let alone the future with, you know, a new AI tool developed at the speed of light. But, you know, what trends and innovations do you see shaping the future of law? And how do you ensure your firm is adapting to stay at the forefront of these unprecedented changes? Yeah, um, thanks, Rob. And, and that's, that's a really good question. I definitely don't have a perfect answer because we're still working on that one and 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 trying our best I and mean, i think on the values point we're becoming a, a b corp which is quite new for uh, law firms that there's a there's a few and there's likely a few in the pipeline but that's been um a tremendous amount of work and challenges to to, to get us ready but it's been very fulfilling in that you realize suddenly in the office you've got these amazing client products that are environmentally friendly and we've it's really rallied us as a team and it's been key to our recruitment strategy to to that 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 culture and i think those sorts of initiatives of which there are there are many you know businesses for good certifications um that that's really key for us because i think that really talks to the next generation who when when you're speaking to lawyers of tomorrow there's much more interrogation of the firms the the values what they stand for and how they're trading and making the world a better place than perhaps 20 years ago more of a binary hierarchy of becoming a partner or going in house and and so i think that's evolving very positively as, as a trend i think you're right tech tech is a huge part of law you know and it's it's a case of making sure one's proposition is is right for for clients and I, I i've been fortunate to do some work with the city of london on a law and technology innovation panel which brought together 
um, the views of uh, law techs, law technology firms, law firms and in-house counsel. And it was really interesting, the kind of dialogue of what each party wanted. And I, I personally see the evolution of, of tech as a real opportunity. You know, that the use of AI will keep, keep things cost effective for clients. It will allow lawyers in firms and nimble that adapt to step up a little bit more and do the really interesting strategic work for, for, for clients. And thinking of, you know, giving back and the lawyers of tomorrow, it hopefully makes for a more interesting trading contract. And perhaps, you know, my, my view would be it would accelerate the trading contract so that whilst it will be different and we don't know exactly what's going to look like, instead of it being, you know, very, you get to five, seven years post-qualification experience, now there are lawyers that, that, that are doing the SQE, that, 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 are, that are doing a vocational quali- qualification straight after A-levels. And actually, I think probably a bit like, you know, your, your granddad's day, and, and thank you for, for sharing that. Maybe it's much more you're taking on your, your personal skills. And ironically, it almost comes full circle to a, a less tech heavy world where you are more meritocratic on what value you're delivering. And, and, and that necessarily has to come back to personal brand, I think. So I'm quite ex- excited about it. I think there's some dangers where firms are, if you get into a kind of race to the bottom on price or proposition you you could be in in trouble you know and i think the legal market isn't as big as many law techs that are starting out think it is you know from from the top of my head 120,000 lawyers ish is isn't actually that huge a market you know if you're trying to to mass market a tech project a product where you know maybe you've got 40 odd thousand lawyers in cities and, and many build their own tech in larger firms so i think there's going to be some interesting developments and growth as 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 law tech consolidates and starts to actually work both for firms both for law tech um, providers themselves and actually crucially most important for what what clients want and how they want it delivered yeah no and there's so many amazing points you you mentioned there as well and i definitely agree on the 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 race to the bottom point with with tech as well i I think you know it's always i always say you know price is what you pay value is what you get right so clients are going to you know the ones that trust you that that know you you know they're going to to see the value and it's our job as you know professional service providers and whatever it might be for them to really understand that 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 value and see it as a two-way um, relationship and it's fantastic you mentioned b corp as well it's great to see more and more firms pushing to that we've had mandy for verdi um the founder of core maxwell come on the show they've done that dane dana denise smith the oblix support they've recently gone through b corp so it's, it's really great that you know you're you're pioneering firms and these are examples of sort of you know the, the new birth of firms that are really getting the values correct not only in terms of the people but in terms of what the clients want and all the other things that maybe some of the larger firms you know put on websites but we don't necessarily see carry through and so one of the other things I know that you're very passionate about, um, Alex, is um, gender di- of diversity and empowerment in the workplace alongside making the legal profession more accessible to all. Um, you may be aware we're, we're supported and sponsored by Clear, and they have a huge mission to transform the mission, um, the legal experience for all, which is just a, such an ostentatious um, goal and mission that we love it, you know, and we absolutely support it here on the show. But what steps are you and your firm taking to ensure inclusivity and accessibility within the profession? Yes, that that's that's one. So, so there's there's all sorts of key notions of diversity for law that are hugely important to champion. The really obvious one for us is is gender diversity, and that you know, whilst we have an ethics and diversity committee that meet monthly and do a huge amount of work to police what we're doing, to challenge what we're doing, to look at our charities of the year and how we pivot and evolve those, and ultimately to prepare the B Corp annual report that we'll be doing, and and obviously to oversee that process. Um, we do that and, and um, we've instated a mental health officer as well, which, which has been really important culturally. Gender specifically, we so that committee looked very carefully at what we're doing. We, we have three quarter female a partnership and senior leadership team and, and, and actually involve key senior female leaders in the business in our senior leadership team meetings, in our partners meetings, in our steering committees and, and, and group meetings so that actually you articulated it better for me earlier on um, that uh, you don't want to have an echo chamber. You want to have those diverse views and challenges and, and a right to challenge. So those are sort of key things that we've factored in. We run a diversity survey one, once a year. Um, the Solicitors Rugby Authority require you to do certain things quite rightly in that respect as well. So we're monitoring it really carefully and 
I think there's plenty more we, we, we can be doing and be building on. But then also we're looking at the trainees that we have and the paralegals and models of making sure we're contributing to, to juniors coming through. So sometimes we have two or three junior colleagues that, that already have training contracts elsewhere and, and, and are doing a fixed term contract with us. And then we'll, and, and a disproportionate number of them are, are female and, are, you know, in my view, business leaders of the future. And we take the time to kind of write to their firms and, and give them a heads up. You know, this person's be, been brilliant, which invariably they, they, they have and, and, and hopefully they come pre-trained for those firms so that they've got a, a leg up on the ladder for their careers and had really nice feedback from a massive white shoe firm, one of the UK's leading um, uh, uh, city, a very traditional but fantastic city, city firm where a, a couple of these folks have, have gone to and we've, we've taken the time to write and to share and had really nice feedback on how they've got on. And so it's making sure you get those feet on, on the ladder, even when that is someone else's ladder. I think that's, that's, been, that's been key as well to championing gender diversity. Yeah, and again, you're you're doing so much more than than the words with all the actions and the various processes again and and systems you have in place to to really make that change. And we've had um, you know I Stephanie Boyce, we've had Lovna Shuja, we've had Christina Blacklaws, various other past presidents of the Law Society of England world who've done tremendous work from on the show. And it's great to see that there's law firm owners really taking and owning that responsibility and and championing it too. So Alex, finally, you know Ignition Law is not shy of winning a few awards. You've won multiple awards, and you've been shortlisted yourself. Uh, for the Lawyer Awards, Modern Law Awards, the Law Society Awards, Financial Times Innovated Lawyer Awards. What future plans do you have for Ignition Law and are there any initiatives you're particularly excited about? It's a good question. I think one of the things we're trying to look at carefully is making sure that we, at some point, start to keep working on our structuring, you know, building out the, the clarity of career track. I think that, that's an area where we've, got, we've still got a fair bit of work to do ourselves to start to articulate this is how this is how you grow and develop. That that was something that the larger firms when I was a junior was was really clear and was our you know really articulate and and that that's an area where we've we've got all of our values really um, clear and our mission statement up to date this year and that's that's a key piece of work for us to start to talk about career growth and, and strategy and and how one can merit meritocratically progress. I think building an alumni network for clients and um, past colleagues is. You know, is something that's not new. Most firms do, but building our small version of that's the we've um, registered BD dot law and plan to have got have got a prototype working of a um, business development uh, course and, uh, to teach lawyers um, uh, um, BD skills and how to kind of really build their personal brand, which often you know happens a little bit too late. So that's that's a really key initiative. And then we're looking at our really early stage stuff and taking that. Um, into a kind of unregulated world called Smart Start that's going to be allowing juniors to start to kind of skill up in a very safe environment where it's unregulated, it's no professional indemnity insurance, lower cost, but but actually operating in a kind of safe space to start to kind of grow their skills, do shareholders agreements, keep keep costs down, plug some AI in and have a, have a have an explore together with with clients on earlier stage lower lower cost solutions for 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 startups. I think the big initiative is this full-time business development colleague um, that's just that's just joined us, Toby, who is is picking up on on our BD, starting to consolidate what we're doing with our data and how we're looking at servicing clients better and cross-selling. So that's that's really exciting. I think that leads us into kind of subscription services for general counsels and to try and have really clear, clear um, very competitive, cost certain solutions. Which um, yeah, which is quite an exciting one. It's super exciting. And yeah, I definitely like the sound of subscription. I like the um, smart start and what that stands for. Yeah, I think it's all very entrepreneurial. It's very cutting edge. And yeah, I'm excited to see it all uh, come to fruition, as I'm sure it will. Um, Alex, look, if our listeners, which I'm sure they will as well, want to learn more about your career journey, Ignition Law or Ignition Financial, where can they find out more? And if people want to follow or get in touch with anything we've discussed today, what's the best way to, them to contact you? Feel free to shout out any social media handles or web links. We'll also make sure we share them with this episode for you too. Thanks so much, Rob. Well, we, I'm more than happy to help directly with anything that anyone in your community wants, wants to ask. Um, our website is ignition.law, www.ignition.law. And our, our social media handle is, is, is exactly that. Do please reach out. I'm on alex at ignition.law. Any feedback, positive, constructive, it's still still a journey. More than happy to help. So 
yeah, anything we can do to contribute, um, we, we, we're here anytime. Fabulous. Well, thank you so, so much once again, Alex. I've really enjoyed today's discussion. Lots of wisdom shared. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. From all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast, wishing you lots of continued success with your career in Ignition Law and other ventures. But for now, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world-leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club, over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.